Um, now, the next question to be addressed by John um, is the one about what impact at institutional level should be expected from investment in CPD for academic staff, um, and how might we even measure such an impact? John, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, very much, and great to be here. Um, it gets scarier as we go down that way, because um, I feel it's a charlatan in some ways, because um, I'm just an academic who teaches, and I actually go back to teach a class at 6 o'clock this evening. Um, so even though some of us might move to the dark side, I believe anybody on the dark side should be in a classroom, should be doing research. And I think this polarization of teaching and research and, and management and leadership are something that we should be mindful of and be careful. But Jim, I, I welcome your report. Um, I welcome its evidence-based. I think you know, for too long we've been making decisions and policy change without evidence. We need data, whether that's qualitative data or actual data and both triangulating against each other are incredibly welcome. Um, I suppose we shouldn't forget, um, well, uh, one criticism, and, and this won't come as a surprise to some people in this room, when I look at leadership, I would have thought we might listen to student leadership, um, because of all places, I think, in the digital space, our students are ahead. At least my experience is that in our university, our students are using a greater array and diversity of technologies competently, uh, maybe not always doing the things we want them to do, but actually, where does learning begin and end? So I think we also need to listen to students, and certainly uh, one of the questions I will pose at the end is what role might students play in staff CPD in TEL? And that's a kind of an interesting space. I had a digital conference recently led by David Putnam in Cork, um, and uh, I had a 12-year-old young lady give a presentation as a keynote speaker. Because in some ways... Um, that gap between what we believe and what we know actually is getting wider. Um, and last Friday I presented to my academic council a vision and a plan for our online learning. And I looked around the room and I certainly want people to start thinking about basic things like Blackboard, what colour it is, and so forth. So I think we are actually at a very large chasm <coughs> between what people in this room are very competent and comfortable with as opposed to the vast majority of our faculty. But I think you know, there are extrinsic drivers here, and Jim has referenced some in his report, but also the national strategy has said, you know, and I quote, we must ensure that all teaching staff are both qualified and competent in teaching and learning and should support ongoing development and improvement. And Jim, in his report, says the, intensi the intensification of CPD for academic staff is critical, and our leaders agree, 70% said, actually, and the IOTs were even better in their commitment in terms of the, the, the extent to which CPD is important but only 40% of institutions were explicit in how we might achieve that. So there's our rhetoric in, some, in recognizing that we actually need professional development and the extent to which the technology element comes into that is even a question in our own mind. But my experience is that academics have in this intrinsic motivations. And notice I'm using academics rather than teachers and teaching and learning because I think it is that richness that comes between the exchange of research-led teaching, research-informed teaching. And my experience, there's intrinsic motivation that awareness of the challenges and opportunities offered by a new technology is something that our colleagues are, and I are interested in. A greater awareness of accountability for teaching um, through quality process and audits. Some ac academic staff value certification. If I look at my university, where over 60% of the staff have a qualification in teaching and learning, the vast majority of those come from medicine and engineering because there's a culture of professional development in those disciplines. And I suppose one of the outcomes I would like over the period, whether it's e-learning or otherwise, is that there would be a professionalization of academic practice, that we would begin to see ourselves as professionals. And part of professionalization comes the whole idea of CPD. That CPD would become the norm, and we get greater satisfaction, and we get greater engagement with our students, but perhaps also importantly, a greater engagement with our HR departments and our institutions, so that they can enable us on this journey of bringing our colleagues and staff along the way. So one of the questions then is, of course, how do you measure the effectiveness? Because, and I think we, we need to be really careful about the compact. Um, we can become slavish to the compact. It's no surprise to me that we don't have undergraduate online courses. Our institutions get our money on the headcount. We get the behaviours that we get put, handed to us. So if we get, we get the behaviours of the, the people who pay us. But you know, when the dial shifts and we get less than 50% of our money into our institutions from government, then we might see an interesting change in the, the extent to which we will start doing creative things. So measuring effectiveness is really quite tricky um, because in some ways, as an ecologist, it's really nice to be here, but diversity bestows stability. 
is the central axiom in ecology. Diversity bestows stability. So the diversity of measures that we take, the diversity of measures which we teach, the diversity of measures which we assess are critical. And technology enables us, for the first time perhaps, to diversify and use the analytics that were mentioned here today that perhaps we're not losing or using. So I think there's a real opportunity that we can actually measure impacts because up to now, they've largely focused on the effects of teachers' attitudes and knowledge and skills as measures of impacts. And there's been lots of literature in the research and uh, research and literature which supports kind of a number of key measures of the impact of CPD. Academic reactions, participation's conceptual change, participants, teachers, academics, behavioural change, development and change of the organisational support for teacher development and changes to student learning and performance. But what it also says is that it has to be anchored in a discipline, and I think each of us find our home in our disciplines. That's where we actually know the pedagogy is relevant, and the extent to which that CPD actually supports um, that kind of approach. So in my own university, I, I'm only in this role seven months, I decided the best thing to do on the area of technology is to understand what my staff felt. So we undertook a survey last summer. Um, 840 staff responded to the survey, and it's astonishing what you, what you pick up. Um, some of the key messages is that some people were unsure of the possibilities of TEL. Unsure of the possibilities. Some people were not able to use the vi virtual VLEs that we described, Blackboard and others, to the full extent that we might want to do it. Some people were unsure of the opportunities for training. But more importantly, people identified the barriers. And the barriers were not about money, actually. The barriers were not about the fact that we had all the cutbacks. The barriers were about not fun, fully understanding the, pers the possibilities, not having the time, not having the opportunity, and not having the training and the framework. So in our university, what I'm doing is undertaking a whole range of training operations which would be anchored in an academic practice framework, not a teaching and learning qualification, but an academic practice framework. And, I'm, and I think that's really, really important that we begin to bring um, both the researchers and teachers together because otherwise we've run the risk of polarizing those. Now, one of the really interesting messages that's from the literature, of course, is that these short, sharp courses are not effective. If you do a short, sharp course, um, it all sounds great. We'll, we'll, do the, we'll do the technology week, and we'll all fall into that trap. And actually, the effectiveness and the, the impact of that seems to be quite limited. Um, so I think we need to be mindful of the approach we take. So the barriers to the enhancement of teaching and learning transfer of learning from professional development activities include the lack of departmental support, it was already referenced, the fact that the leaders in the departments, lack of funding and resources, and a lack of interest from colleagues, and resistance to change. So all the kind of mixes of things we're trying to do um, bring on very sharp relief of CPD. But I'd come back to the professionalization question. If we can transform our organization such that we as academics want to be professionals, it naturally follows that we will have CPD. So in conclusion, what I hope the outcomes of all of these dialogues will be that CPD becomes the norm, that we'll have a professionalization of academic practice, because this will lead to digital champions locally. I think the real success of transformation will be where you have champions locally who are won over and will provide the greatest opportunity. It might surprise you, maybe it won't surprise you, that some of the best digital literacy in my college doesn't come in the technology and the sciences area at all, it comes from English. Um, you know, so there are real champions who can drive real change. And then for each individual, we develop a pathway and paths to increase their creativity using technology enhanced learning. And I suppose ultimately for CPD to customize a discipline specific programs that are relevant to increase people's technology enhanced learning. Thank you very much for your attention.